Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress. Thanks for tuning in this morning, and I'm happy to return our discussion to the book we're currently reading, The Papacy and the Civil Power, by R.W. Thompson. Remember last time we were talking a bit about the papal precedent that was set in the world beginning with the crowning of Charlemagne. Charlemagne allowed himself to be crowned by the Pope and made emperor by the Pope. And since then, the papacy has claimed by divine right to crown the kings of the earth. No king may rule upon the earth unless he has the sanction and approval and support and protection and blessing of the Pope. He rules over the kings of the earth. Now, this precedent was set in 800 A.D. at the crowning of Charlemagne, and that, is, that precedent has multiplied throughout history to the point where no king ruled in Europe unless he was crowned by the Pope. Every king owed his first allegiance to the Pope, and he ruled at the Pope's behest. Now, the Protestant Reformation overthrew that old world order, and the new world order is just the reestablishment of the old world order. Now, we're going to back up a couple paragraphs for continuity from where we left off last time to carry the thought of this precedent, this diabolical anti-Christ precedent that was set by the popes at the crowning of Charlemagne. R.W. Thompson, a great historian and one who was astutely trained to assess the gravest threats to our Protestant constitutional republic, both foreign and domestic, asserted that if this constitutional republic was ever overthrown, it would be by the power of the popes. That is exactly what's happening today. Now, he says, Louis the Pious, son of Charlemagne, submitted the division of his empire to the confirmation of the Pope. And says this author, quote, From that time it became the usage and practice that the Franco, Roman, and German emperors became such only with the consent, uh, the consent of the Roman pontiff, the Pope, and on, be, and on being crowned by him. So the opening sentence of this paragraph confirms that with the crowning of uh, Louis the Pious, son of Charlemagne, and Charlemagne also was crowned by the Pope, it set the papal precedent that the Pope crowns all the kings. And it says the Franco-Roman and German emperors became kings only with the consent of the Roman pontiff, the Pope. And they gave that consent when they consented to be crowned by him. Now it says, nor was this the case with the emperors of the West alone, for the kings of England, Poland, Hungary, Croatia, Sweden, and Denmark loved to receive their crowns at the Pope's hands and to place their dominions, their countries, their nations, under the especial guarantee and protection of the Holy See. Unquote. Now, somebody has said that the doctrine of the common law, uh, excuse me, the doctrine of the common law lawyers, that precedent makes the law, is a very dangerous one, because by means of it, error may often obtain sanction. So it is clear that this author indicates that if precedence makes law, then error can become law. This author is openly affirming that allowing the Pope to crown the kings of Europe was a precedent of error. Okay, this author is Protestant, obviously. And he says, this undoubtedly, this is undoubtedly the case with these papal precedents. 
For if they are to be recognized now as conferring rights which are not to be called in question, then all dispute is at an end, for Rome has spoken. It is alone by these precedents that this comprehensive authority of the popes is maintained, and it is for this purpose alone that these references are made by this author. True, he avoids any direct discussion of the question of political right, yet takes care to let the papal followers understand that these examples prove it also belonged to the Pope, he, that, that, the, that the political right also belongs to the Pope, because in the instances cited, all, quote, the peoples and princes, unquote, regarding him, quote, as the vicar of Christ and the supreme arbiter of all on earth, According to the saying, quote, He who is competent to the greater is also competent to the less, unquote. That is, he who derives his right to govern in spiritual things directly from God must govern also in temporal things because the spiritual are greater and higher than the temporal. He shows this to be his meaning by telling us what Count de Meister teaches on this subject in his essay Sur le Mort, where he says that all the Christian princes considered the Pope, quote, to be a judge between them and their people, unquote, and also by quoting with, the ap with approbation what the same author says in his essay Sur la Histoire Generale as follows, quote, the interests of mankind demand a bridle by which princes may be restrained and the people saved. This bridle might by common consent be placed in the hands of the Roman pontiff. Such a high priest, mingling in worldly conflicts only to silence them, admonishing alike the sovereign and his people of their duties, condemning their crimes, and visiting his excommunication on great wrongs would be looked upon as the living representative and likeness of God upon the earth, unquote. So they're saying the Pope is the head of the spiritual world, and therefore common sense dictates that he must also be over the temporal world. And this is represented by the two keys on the Vatican flag, the golden key and the silver key, the golden key representing the Pope's temp, uh, spiritual power, and the silver key representing his kingly power. And those two keys, the gold overlaying the silver, are bound by a scarlet-colored cord. In other words, they cannot be separated. If you separate the, pap the papacy from his temporal power, he cannot exercise his priestly power, his spiritual power. Therefore, if he has the spiritual power, he must also be able to dictate to the kings of the earth how they must govern over the people. And then the Pope has the right to stand in interference between the people and their king and, and set them straight in their duties and their manner of life. In other words, he is king of kings and lord of lords. That is the universal demand of the papacy. It's been the order of the papacy since nearly its founding. If the Pope really is the successor of Peter, and that Peter is the rock and foundation of the church, then the Pope is the rock and foundation of the church. It's blasphemy. And it was warned about in the scriptures. That's why the scriptures call him the man of sin. He has usurped Christ's rightful throne, as if Christ were dead and it was necessary for the Pope to be his replacement on earth. And as his replacement, he, uh, he arrogates to himself all the power, all the rights, all the sovereignty, the spiritual power, and the temporal power of Christ's heavenly kingdom.
Now, in support of this theory of the Pope's temporal right to exercise dominion over the world so as to mingle in worldly conflicts and to keep mankind to the line of their duties according that he shall decide what is right and what is wrong, he also cites numerous instances to show that for many years emperors and kings recognized it in relation to themselves and their subjects and gloried in their humiliation. That's right, it became the boast of these Roman Catholic kings of Europe that they received their crown from the Pope and that he is the arbiter of all truth and that he stands in the way between the governors or the kings and their people exercising righteousness excommunicating heretics and setting kings right they boasted that they were nothing but slaves of the papacy, humiliated by the papacy, reduced to a groveling moron. Check your brain in your Bible at the door, Mr. King. You just do whatever the papacy tells you to do, and you work righteousness in the world because the Pope is the king of the world by divine right. Humiliation. They gloried in their own humiliation. And that's the state of affairs the papacy expects in this our day, that all the kings of the earth grovel at his feet, and that the people worship him as a god. That's the new world order. And it says he gives a special prominence to the case of Henry II of England, who was, quote-unquote, obliged to prostrate himself before the pontifical throne and submit to the decrees of the Pope, and also to that of Frederick Barbarossa, who was forced, quote, by the heavy hand of God to bow his head and sue for pardon, unquote. And to enforce his views still more strongly, as well as to give the utmost influence to the precedents by which he endeavors to establish the temporal authority of the Pope, he quotes from an address to him by the Queen Mother of Richard the Lionhearted, wherein she says, quote, Now listen to this. If you want to hear some brown nosing of the Pope, listen to this. The mother, the Queen Mother of Richard Lionhearted said of the Pope, quote, Did not the Lord confer plentitude of power on Peter? And on you, through him, blessed be the Lord who gave such power to men that no king, no emperor, no duke can withdraw himself from its jurisdiction. In other words, from the Pope's jurisdiction. The Prince of the Apostles still governs in his see, and a judicial power is constituted in our midst. Draw then the sword of Peter. The cross of Christ takes precedence of the imperial eagles, and the sword of Peter goes before that of Constantine. In other words, the spiritual power, which, he, which she refers to as the sword of Peter, goes before or leads that of Constantine. And that's a reference to to the temporal power. Constantine was a temporal authority. He was the king of uh, United er Europe at the time when the Roman Catholic Church was accepted as the state religion in Rome. And it's simply a, a, an artistic way of saying that the divine right power, the spiritual power of the Pope, precedes that of his temporal power. And never can they be separated. Now, he also considers it important to show that this doctrine, so earnestly recommended for adoption in this country, the United States of America, and by which all the world would be necessarily and unavoidably placed under the rule of the papacy, had the sanction of other emperors and kings, including Philip and Frederick II of Germany, Philip II 
St. Louis, Louis the, the 11th, Charles the 8th, Henry the 4th, Louis the 13th, and Louis the 14th of France, and Henry the 7th, Henry the 8th, and Mary of England. So all of these kings and queens assented to the spiritual and temporal authority of the Pope. And it's no wonder that the Protestant Reformation grew up out of Europe. Throwing off this temporal and spiritual power of the Pope and called him Antichrist. God help his people recall the days of the Protestant Reformation when Christ became king, spiritual and temporal, over the hearts and minds of God's people. And the Pope was put in his proper place, reduced to beggary. Now, how faithful he follows the court of a lawyer in a common law court who lays down his premises and supports them by showing that numerous judges have, been, have made decisions of the like character. And yet seems not to have occurred to him that he is attempting a task of difficult achievement. That is, to make the people of the United States, including the numbers of Roman Catholics, believe that imperialism, even in its mildest form, is preferable to the political liberty they now enjoy. R.W. Thompson is saying, the papacy in all his glory has a difficult task in overthrowing Protestantism in this country and reducing the people to glory in their humiliation like the kings of Europe did because they've tasted liberty. They've set their own king who rules at their behest, not the Pope's. They've written a constitution that guarantees the rights of the people that the Pope has no power to take away. How difficult it would be in this United States even among the Catholics of this country who have enjoyed liberty and freedom and the right to choose their own, their own rulers. To subject them once again to the tyrannical Antichrist power of the Pope. But that's precisely what is happening in this country today. Our government is becoming more and more tyrannical, interfering into the, the intimate lives of every man, woman, and child in this country, controlling ec economics, corrupting the churches with this ecumenical movement, involving this world in world conquest for the Pope, crusade after crusade after crusade. And the Roman Catholics in our government, even the cooperative ecumenical Protestants cooperating to make Roman Catholic canon law the law of this land, overthrowing our Constitution right in front of our faces. And no one seems to recognize what's really going on and who's behind it. Well, we know here at Inquisition Update, and all we have to do is read this book, History, Accurate History of the Conditions that Existed in Europe, the power of the Pope to control the kings, and we must realize, we just simply must realize by the power of common sense alone that that is the direction the Pope would have this country go, and that's exactly the direction we're going. How faithfully he follows the course of a lawyer in a common law court who lays down his premises and supports them by showing that numerous judges have made decisions of the like character. And yet it seems to not have occurred to him that he is attempting a task of difficult achievement, that is, to make the people of the United States, including the numbers of Roman Catholics in this country, to believe that imperialism, that is, papal imperialism, tyranny, even in its mildest form, is preferable to the political liberty they now enjoy right here in the United States of America. 
R. W. Thompson says how unlikely it will be that the Pope will be successful in this country if common sense prevails. But common sense has faltered. The Protestant Reformation has faltered. The ecumenical movement is all-powerful. And this country is ready to walk away from its liberty in the name of security, which disguises this papal new world order that's coming upon us. It says, in every instance he has referred to, including popes, emperors, kings, and princes, the parties were united in their exertions to establish the divine right of kings to rule the world in opposition to the right of the people to govern themselves and solely with the selfish motive of continuing their own power. It's all about power. It's all about overthrowing the Bible and Christ. Christ and His Word and to enslave God's people and thereby increasing their power. It says, None of them had the slightest regard for the rights of the people and all supposed, as the defenders of the papacy now do, that the people were made to be governed, not to govern, and that they required, as Dr. Brownson says, a master. They were all personally interested in doing exactly what they did in order to keep their crowns safely upon their heads, and considered unitedly they were conspirators against human freedom. If now we are to recognize what they did and said as establishing a law for our government, we might, with light propriety, and by the same process of reasoning, justify the most abominable and demoralizing vices by showing that what it would be that what it would be easy to show that they were all, including some of the popes, adepts in almost every form of corruption. At the times when these examples were set, the bulk of the European people were in a state of profound ignorance, and it was essential to the divine right of absolutism that they should be kept so. For in their ignorance they were taught by ambitious, cunning, and corrupt priests to believe that the Pope was equal to God. While this delusion existed, they dared not resist a king or a prince, however tyrannical, who had the Pope's endorsement, for that would have been considered a violation of God's commands and punished by excommunication and anathema. Hence, these kings and princes were careful to obtain this endorsement, and the popes were equally careful to see that the light of intelligence was shut out from the popular mind, so that by a continuance of the delusion, they could share between themselves the government of the whole civilized world. They must be bold and presumptuous men who ask us, as these Jesuit missionaries do, to exchange the present condition of our affairs for that they so fondly picture, to undo what the people, acting for themselves, have so nobly done in resistance to misgovernment and tyranny and plunge in blind submission and at a single bound back again into medieval times. He's just described once again in more eloquent terms what the new world order is. It's simply the old world order restored. Antichrist, come to Protestant USA. God forbid. Now we're going to talk about that power, that glorious God-given power that liberated the passive, obedient people of Europe and the kings of Europe from the of the Antichrist at Rome. He says, when Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms demanded to debate his theses with the emissaries of the Pope, he struck a terrible blow at the doctrine of, pace, of passive obedience. 
which it is now sought with so much earnestness to revive. Whatever may have been his religious belief, and no Protestant of this day are, uh, and no Protestants of this day are responsible for it, he then became the champion of free thought and as such courageously planted himself on the side of the people and between them and their papal oppressors. On that simple basis, he laid the foundation upon which a magnificent fabric has since been reared, and he who now attempts to pull it down should be treated as a public enemy by all free people. By his example, he taught that the people he taught the people to think, and to reason, and to investigate for themselves. The scales fell gradually from their eyes, and they came to realize the character and nature of the popish and princely tricks, tricks by which they had been cheated out of their liberty, and at last roused themselves up into a vigorous and robust mankind. They snapped asunder the chains of their servitude and asserted in the face of their rulers those great liberties which were never firmly established as legal rights until the government of the United States was formed and Protestantism was thereby enabled to achieve a full development. Protestantism has therefore become the special guardian of these liberties while the papacy remains as ever their deadly and malignant foe. The former clings to them with undiminished affection. The latter aims at them its most deadly blows. The Roman Catholic hierarchy of the United States join with this insatiate hostility and are leaving no stone unturned in their efforts to persuade their adherents, that is, the Roman Catholics in this country, to return to the old order of things. There you have it. That was the old world order. And R.W. Thompson even uses those words, the old order of things. Now, you must know and comprehend, and I know this sounds repetitious, but the new world order is that old world order restored. Now, their greatest and strongest argument is that repeated by Dr. Wenninger. Because these iniquitous compacts between popes and kings in the past centuries have made it the law of the Roman Catholic Church that every human being should be governed by the quote-unquote king of Rome as God's representative. Therefore, the modern and progressive idea that the people shall make their own governments and laws is infidelity and heresy and deserves the anathema of the damnation of the church and the curse of God. And presuming upon either the submissiveness or ignorance, or both, of those who are called the faithful, that is, Roman Catholics, they assert their authority to command in the name of the Pope with a supercilious air which can only arise from an imagined superiority to the remainder of mankind. Dr. Wendinger is a distinguished and conspicuous member of this class, and with seeming assurance of obedience, he exclaims, quote, Yes, the Catholic world at large, without any difference of nationality, hemisphere, or zone, acknowledges also in our times, by an interior conviction of faith, the Apostolic See as the highest tribunal on earth in matters of faith, and the Roman Pontiff, the Pope, to be the infallible teacher of the faithful peoples on the globe. Unquote. It cannot fail to arrest attention that in whatsoever mode the writers of this class speak of the Pope, they all reach the same result the omnipotent power of the papacy and its absolute incapacity to do anything wrong. When they speak of matters of faith, as this author does, they intend to include the temporalities of government and such civil and political rights as American Protestantism has guaranteed. This has already partially appeared, but it will be seen more undeniably hereafter. 
It has also been demonstrated that the papacy teaches that Protestantism is heresy and infidelity, no religion at all, a mockery of God, and therefore this Jesuit author teaches that all Roman Catholics are bound by duty to the highest tribunal of the earth to exterminate it and to plant Roman Catholicism in its place so that the Pope, as the only infallible teacher, shall prescribe the laws and the institutions we are to obey and appoint his ecclesiastical officers and agents to see that they are executed to reward the faithful and punish the refractory and disobedient. What has this author just told us? That the Pope demands that the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country form themselves into a shadow government, that by them they overthrow the apparent government and impose upon them the sanction of the papacy to make this country Catholic and Avro Manhattan asserted the exact same thing in very specific language in his book, The Vatican Billions, that the bishoprics, the archbishoprics, the priests, all the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church are indeed the shadow government in this country. That's why they are so involved in politics, because it is by politics, by social policy, by the laws of this land that they impose Roman Catholic canon law and assert without our knowledge the power of the papacy, the temporal and spiritual authority of the papacy over us. So the laws of this country are corrupt. They're not for the benefit of the people. They're, for, they're written for the benefit of the Pope. And slowly but surely, they have conformed our laws to that of the Roman Catholic Church, despite our Constitution and the prohibition of the separation of church and state and the establishment of a religion in this country. And it's time for God's people to wake up to what's going on. R.W. Thompson had it right. He says, Why are books containing these and other kindred teachings published and circulated in the United States? Why is it necessary to fix such principles in the minds of, Roman Catholic, of the Roman Catholic part of our population? What have they, as citizens of the United States, to do with such royal examples as these books set before them, with the claims of authority asserted centuries ago by emperors, kings, princes, and popes? Protestantism tried hard to exist among these tyrants, but could not except in a modified and imperfect form, because it could not reach its consummation where political bondage existed. And these imperial despots could, none of them, live in the atmosphere of freedom. Each required congenial nourishment suited to its nature. Protestantism demanded liberty and imperialism bondage. And therefore Protestants sought a new world, and left the absolutism of popes and kings in possession of the old, to oppress, persecute, and tyrannize under the plea of divine right. It occupied a field which, pro uh, which providence had preserved for it, wherein it could, work its, it could work out its own results without fear of rival. But now, when in the full tide of successful progress it finds itself confronted by its old enemy, who has grown up here under its protection, and who, just as imperialism is threatened with destruction in all southern and western Europe, is endeavoring with unbounded impudence to destroy it, at the risk of an angry and deadly conflict between the principles of democracy and those of monarchy. And with no less unbounded effrontery, it points us to the combinations of despots, to their impious claim of divine sanction for all the wrongs and outrages they have in inflicted on mankind, and to the approbation given them by crowned popes to prove that precedents thus furnished have ripened into rights 
which the world must now recognize as sanctioned of God and which have thereby become the law for the hierarchy of the United States, excuse me, have now become the law for the government of mankind. For such a work of the, as this, the hierarchy of the United States, that is, the Roman Catholic hierarchy of the United States, seems well and peculiarly prepared by education and inclination. It remains to be seen hereafter how many submissive followers they can enlist under the papal banner with mottos like these upon it. In the meantime, those who have the heritage of Protestantism to guard and defend should not be unmindful of the triumphs it has already won, the brilliant future lying before it, if preserved, and the ignominious grave into which it must sink, if lost. There's the ultimatum. If you'll preserve Protestantism and keep the papacy in check, you will continue to enjoy a brilliant future. But if you allow Protestantism to die, democracy or republicanism to die, and to allow papal tyranny to creep into your country, you will sink into a grave. That's the destiny of the United States. R. W. Thompson puts it in plain language. Now, we've thus concluded Chapter 4 of the book. Now we'll uh, delve into Chapter 5, if you're following along, page 130. We're going to discuss in this chapter, the Pope's infallibility makes him a domestic prince in all nations. The Pope's never exceeded the limits of their authority. Hardy har har. That, you're going to love that one. The temporal power divinely conferred as part of the spiritual, which we've talked about voluminously already. The Pope to be king everywhere. No right of complaint against him. First dogmatic constitution of the late council, that is the Lateran Council of 18, uh, excuse me, the first Vatican Council of 1870. The decree of Pope's infallibility, Archbishop Manning's definition of it, it gives the Pope whatever authority he claims. It is a personal privilege. It confers, it confers coercive power upon the Pope. That one is going to be new to many of my listeners, particularly if they're new listeners to Inquisition Update. The present governments are dissolving, and the syllabus alone will save them. Okay, this is going to be a rather busy chapter, and I pray God give you attention so that you can hear and understand the words of this author and understand my explanations and discussion about them. All right, he, he begins by saying it is not probable that any candid man, whatever his attachment to particular creeds or church organizations, will be disposed to deny that the Roman Catholic profession of faith, even as settled by the Anti-Reformation Council of Trent, contains much that is satisfactory to the Christian mind. Insofar as it lays down the fundamentals of the Christian faith, it is exceptionable, even to the most extreme and rigid Protestants. But when it goes beyond these and gathers up different dogmas of the post-Nicene period, which have been put forward from time to time for the purposes of getting away from the teachings of the Apostolic Fathers, and building up the papal system, its defenders cannot reasonably expect that in this age it will escape the investigation of Protestant communities, compelled as they are now, to defend themselves against papal aggression. But even these might have been left to the exclusive domain of theology, had not the introduction of the new doctrine of the Pope's infallibility exposed conspicuously to the surface that political, fe that political feature of the papal system which, although known to have existed for a long time, has been both concealed and denied in all Protestant countries. 
No, they don't want Protestants to realize that the Pope demands complete temporal authority over them. Now, it says the last chapter pointed out the extent and comprehensiveness of this infallibility as it was claimed by the Jesuits to exist before the decree of the Lateran Council. Even if the investigation of it were to stop at this point, it would sufficiently appear to any thoughtful mind that it sets up for the Pope full authority to deal with the temporalities of the world, to dictate the policy and regulate the affairs of governments, and to step in between the citizen and the civil institutions to which he owes allegiance. But the subject is, of, is so frightful of inquiry that it would require many volumes to exhaust it. Excuse me, let me read that correctly. But the, the, the subject is so fruitful of inquiry that it would require many volumes to exhaust it, each step making the design more apparent. A work was, not long ago, republished and circulated in the United States, which is stamped with the approbation of the Lord Bishop of Beverly in England, and by, uh, and, uh, by way of giving it ecclesiastical authority. The American Roman Catholic hierarchy manifestly consider this book an important auxiliary in propagating the true faith, that is, Roman Catholicism. It has this imposing and attractive title. Listen to the title of this work. It's called His Holiness Pope Pius IX and the Temporal Rights of the Holy See as involving religious, social, and political interests of the whole world, unquote. Quite a title, isn't it? Let me read it again. This is, this is, this is dynamite stuff here. The title of this work is His Holiness Pope Pius IX and the Temporal Rights of the Holy See as involving religious, social, and political interests of the whole world. <laughs> okay? You getting an idea where we're going with this now? It says the perusal of it will not only show with what intense earnestness the cause of the papacy is defended, but explain the grounds upon which that defense is rested. Its avowals are so clearly and frankly made as to entitle the author to our respect on account of his candor, however much we may disagree with or resist his theory. Not content with the treating of the temporal power of the Pope merely in its religious or social aspects, the author asserts that it is, quote, most intimately connected, unquote, also with the political interests and affairs of mankind. With his mind fully impressed by this idea, he declares that, quote, our first duty, however, is toward our most holy Pope Pius IX, who at present so nobly fills the chair of St. Peter, unquote. Accepting this proposition as true, he leaves us to the logical inference that we owe a secondary duty, not a first-degree duty, but a secondary duty to government and society, in all those matters in which the Pope has the right to exact obedience of us. In other words, you must obey the Pope first. And if it comes a question between you and your obedience to the government or your obedience to the Pope, you must obey the Pope, because he rules by divine right. Now, and to show that he so regards it, he adopts the definition of papal supremacy given by Pope Paul VII in 1806, when in answer to a summons by Napoleon I to surrender the political government of Rome, he said, quote, It is not our will, it is the will of God whose place we occupy on earth, unquote. And thus the example of this Pope who blasphemously claimed equality with God and put himself in his place on earth furnishes this author with apology for maintaining, quote, it to be the general duty of all Christians, whatever their country may be, and of all men, 
if they did but know it, to protect the rights of the Holy See, unquote, including, of course, his temporal and political rights, that is, his right as a sovereign king. Anticipating that possibly this idea of allegiance to a foreign prince, the Pope, after all, he is the Prince of Rome, not the United States, anticipating that possibly this idea of allegiance to a foreign prince might excite in the minds of some honest people the apprehension of treachery and bad faith toward their government, especially in Protestant countries, he endeavors to quiet all their scruples of conscience by this artful and insidious uh, argument. Listen to what he says. Quote, Suppose it to be said, quote, I acknowledge the spiritual authority of the Holy Father, but why am I, as an Englishman, or an American, we may add, to come forward in a political way and use all my exertions to protect the temporal rights of a foreign prince? Unquote. My answer at once is plain. The Pope is not a foreign prince in any Christian uh, country, or, or to any Christian, to any human being. Unquote. So, the author is plainly saying that if you are an American and you resent somebody saying that you as an American must protect the temporal power of the Pope, and to help elevate the power of the Pope in your country, the temporal power, you can't say in defense that he's not a domestic, that he's a foreign. Why would I, as an American, want to uphold the temporal power of a foreign prince in my country? Let him be king of Rome. Let him be king of the Vatican. But let him not have anything to say in my country. Here's what the answer of the Pope is to that. I am by divine right the governor of the world. I am domestic everywhere on earth. I am not a foreigner anywhere on earth. The earth is mine in the fullness thereof. Christ created the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water, and I am his vicar on earth, and I'm not a stranger anywhere on this earth. If you believe me to be a stranger, then you are apostate. You fail to recognize the divine right of the Pope to rule everywhere, over every man, woman, and child on the planet, just as Christ does. And you must either repent of your heresy and your obstinance, or you must be killed. And that's where we're going in the New World Order. Now, he says the reader should not pass by this too quickly. It is worthy of much reflection. The last proposition is stating negatively, but it has an affirmative meaning, which is that the Pope is prince and governor over all Roman Catholics, over every human being, no matter where or under what government they live. Although he resides in Rome and is crowned there as a foreign prince, he is nevertheless a domestic one in every country especially where there are Roman Catholics, because God's authority is universal, and he, the Pope, is in the place of God on earth. As the spiritual governor of the world, he is also its political governor. Insofar as political teachings are necessary to the church, because the greater includes the lesser. Therefore, when he finds the faithful living under a government which denies this and is consequently infidel, he, the Pope, has the right to require that they shall come forward in a political way and compel such dissenting and heretical government to obey the law of God by recognizing the Pope's supremacy or that they shall disobey the government when it refuses to do so. There you have it. The Roman Catholic hierarchy is a shadow government. The Roman Catholic people, if they're obedient to their hierarchy, are an antagonistic fifth column, ready to spring at papal command, 
to disobey the laws of this country if they defy the Pope's authority and to make America Catholic by law. That's what they're going to do. That's what they've done. Welcome to the New World Order. I'll see you next time on Inquisition Update.